a good week. Um, looks like we're getting ready for some more rain. Uh, real bummer, at least from my perspective. But um, again, I hope everybody had a good week, uh, got through all your homework, and maybe beyond that, we will be kind of moving on to the next set of information that will go into Go Crop today and over the next week. Um, today, we're going to be covering soil tests and what's on a soil test, what, um, you know, the different components that we look at, what they mean. Uh, where they're going to be used in the plan, and we'll we'll go over manure tests as well um, at the end at the end of the lecture today. And then our homework will be to put the soil test data into Go Crop. Some of you may have already done this, and then we'll also be adding in your crops for the fields that hopefully you got in last week. Um, and we'll also be putting in the rotations that you've selected and going through that um, in Go Crop. So let's get started with soil tests. I just have a typical soil test report put up here on the screen. This one is from UVM. And um, if you've had a recent test, it should look, should look like this. Um, many people also use Dairy One Laboratory, which is in New York. Um, probably most people recognize that uh, for forage analytics, but they also offer soil testing and they uh, do a really nice job as well. And they can provide Vermont specific information. So you may also be using that lab. I would say those are the common labs that are used here in Vermont most frequently. And again, primarily because those two labs, UVM lab and Dairy One lab use Vermont specific extractants, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then they also provide Vermont specific fertility recommendations. So you may have used other labs in the past. I know some people will send their samples to the Midwest, like Spectrum Analytics is one of the labs. Um, there's a whole number of labs out there uh, for sure. And, you know, really the very important component, especially for nutrient management that we're doing here in class, is that your soil testing lab, wherever you're sending your soils, uses the modified Morgan's extractant to determine um, phosphorus and potassium in your soil. And the modified Morgan's extractant is developed and used here in Vermont and also other places in the Northeast. New York actually uses Morgan's and we use modified Morgans. But the reason we use these extractants to measure nutrients in your soil is because this extractant is able to handle the types of soils that we have in Vermont, which are very different than the types of soils that are in, in the uh, South or in the Midwest. And so it's really important to be able to, you know, adequately and accurately um, measure the nutrients in the types of soils that we have here in Vermont and, you know, other places in the Northeast and New England. And part of the difference with our soils is the aluminum level. Um, we tend to have soils that are very high in aluminum, especially outside of the Champlain Valley. Um, and that imparts certain characteristics on the soil. So it's really important for us to use the proper extractant so that we can measure the nutrients that we think will be available to your crops in our Vermont soil types. So that's why we use it. It is a requirement of the nutrient management plan to actually have soil tests that have been um, analyzed and the results 
based on the modified Morgan's extractant. So not only am I recommending it for really good reason, it's also a requirement. So if you don't have those types of soil tests, we cannot write a nutrient management plan. Um, <clears throat> the other important component that a lot of testing labs do not measure is aluminum. And like I said, aluminum is you know, heavily present um, in soils throughout Vermont. Again, usually not in the Champlain Valley where we are, um, but once you get out of the valley, we tend to have very high aluminum soils and it impacts availability of nutrients and we need to account for that. So again, we need aluminum measured, we need the modified Morgan extractant to be used, and that's why we recommend using uh, UVM um, actually, the University of Maine and also uh, Dairy One offers these kinds of analysis. So as far as soil testing goes, to if you're writing a new plan, your soil tests cannot be any older than two years old. So you need to have very recent soil tests that reflect the current sort of nutrient levels of the soils to build a plan. And then after that, the requirement is to have new soil tests per field every three years. So that's not just a requirement of the NMP, it's a state uh, regulatory requirement that you have soil tests for each field that you're managing on your farm that are no older than three years old. So why, <laughs> why is that? Um, you know, it's primarily based on management. So if you have a soil test that you received, you know, for cropping this year, and you follow that soil test, then theoretically, after three years of following the soil test, your soil test will have changed. And actually, even if you didn't follow the soil test, let's say you did more or you just didn't do anything, then it's likely also that your soil nutrient composition has changed. Maybe it went up, maybe it went down, but the changes are usually reflective over a three year period. So that's why there is a requirement um, to take a sample every three years. Generally, you may also choose to soil test more often. Um, I would say most people kind of have difficulties <laughs> getting tests every three years, but some people do sample more often if um, they're rotating a crop, for example. If you're moving from grass to corn or soybeans um, to grass or grass to soybeans, let's say, or corn and you're seeding down a field. Um, having a new soil test that's specific for a particular crop that you're going into um, is always a really good idea, especially when the crop requirements are really different and you really need to know what the soil is, soil uh, nutrient composition is before you start growing this new crop. And I would say that's probably the absolute most important, again, when you're really changing um, crops that have very different nutrient recommendations. So those are, you know, the times uh, when we have to take soil tests and when we might want to take additional tests. Sometimes people um, start changing management really drastically and they want to just measure if it's making a difference, you know, within a year, let's say, or two. So again, you can take soil tests as frequently as you want, but the requirement is uh, every three years. Timing, like when you take the soil sample, honestly, is, is not that critical or that important. Um, you know, consistency is good. So consistency with the lab you're using, consistency with the time of when you take the samples can be important but really just having the sample is what we want. So whenever you find time in a year to do it, 
um, when it needs to be done. That that's the most important thing. Um, traditionally, people take soil tests in the fall a lot because um, usually that's the point at which nutrients are the most drawn down in your soil. You know, after a full year of production, um, and and also it tends sometimes to be a time of the year where there's a little more flexibility, maybe a little more time than obviously the spring of the year, the middle of the growing season. So sometimes there's just more time to do it. Also, you know, for some crops like corn or even soybeans, nobody wants to be out in the field trying to soil sample through a full grown crop of corn. It's not really a whole lot of fun, <laughs> um, especially if you get lost, but which has happened. Yeah, but anyway, you know, really, usually the end of the year before the ground freezes is, is is the time when most people take samples. It also allows you time to get the samples back <laughs> so that you can plan during the winter. You know, if you take soils in the spring and you expect to use them in the spring, it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to take the sample, get the results back, and then, you know, make adjustments. So again, fall generally is kind of the time when we would recommend, but again, just get out there and take them when you can. Okay, um, there's a couple important pieces about you know taking soil samples also that I'll mention. <clears throat> Within a field, um, you know you you want to cover the whole field. If you haven't taken a soil test before. You know, you're, you're supposed to walk a like a W pattern through the field or an M or a zigzag, but you, you kind of want to sample from the front, you know, to the back, uh, the corners. And part of that is to get a obviously a representative sample. If you just hop out of your truck and or car or four wheeler or whatever you're walking and you just sample the front of the field because you you don't feel like you have time <laughs> to walk the whole field, then you may really be skewing the results, right? Because oftentimes the front of the field is where you start spreading manure, as an example, and you always run out when you get to the end, um, or there's less maybe for some reason. So again, if you're not kind of collecting cores over the entire field, um, you could really be skewing the data. <clears throat> so you want to make sure you know, you walk the field and get a representative sample. Now, we, it is a requirement that a one soil sample does not represent more than 20 acres. So if you have a 40 acre field, you would need two soil samples for that field, <coughs> as an example. Um, but anything over 20 acres you are required to have more than one sample. And again, because as those fields get bigger, um, we see the variability in nutrients sometimes, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're able to capture that and also respond to it if we need to. Sometimes it's not hugely different, but it's still, still a requirement. You may want to take more samples per field because you know it's different. Um, you know, there may be one spot that's un really unproductive and you want to figure out. So maybe you want to go out and just sample that one area. And I've seen this happen before um, at fields I've sampled where you know, I can remember an example where a farm said, you know, nothing, nothing grows around this spot here. I just can't get anything to grow here. And we went out and sampled it and it had like a pH of four, <laughs> but the rest of the field was fine. So it is really possible that, you know, fields can differ that much. And if you see a great variability like that, you know, it, it, sometimes it can really pay to, <laughs> to go out and take an extra sample from a certain area. Okay. Um, and again, a representative sample is what you're looking for. You're only taking, you know, 10 cores um you know across the whole field most of the time so you can see how just making sure you walk the whole field is really important i mean the soil test lab just they want one cup of soil uh to represent that whole field so again just making sure you're covering the field is is really critical okay so you you take your sample 
use a soil probe people you don't want to use a shovel <laughs> i mean you can i guess but it's harder to take a representative and and consistent depth uh that's really important you know sample um when you're using a shovel so i i never recommend that for standard soil test um i recommend using a soil probe we have them in our office uh either the conservation districts have them we lend them out they're not that expensive especially if you have a lot of fields you may want to just get your own um you know there's always conversations around the depth of sampling most annual crop fields definitely should be sampled um to the what we would call the tillage depth. Uh, most soil probes are about 10 to 12 inches long. And so you ultimately kind of end up taking roughly about a 10 inch sample every time you stick it in the ground. And that works really well for annual crop fields. Um, now in hay fields, you know, the, the recommendation is a four to six inch deep sample. And, and part of that is because, you know, you're not you're not tilling it, you're not incorporating nutrients, um, and really most of the nutrients that you know get added are relatively in that kind of top six inches. I find it personally really hard. They don't sell well. They might, but I don't think they sell six inch soil probes or four inch soil probes, and so it can be really difficult to get a consistent um four to six inch sample when you're sampling hay fields and then you also end up often getting a lot of thatch too or you know a lot of that kind of top top of the um of the sod so you know i personally for people taking their own samples just recommend just taking the soil core it's you're going to get the most consistent sample you're not going to stress out about it you're not going to take a four inch one and an eight inch one and maybe a six inch one um you know so just you got the probe use the probe it's going to be a, a decent sample um and that you know that's just what i recommend okay so you you need to send the sample into the lab you only need a cup they actually get really annoyed when you send in a you know quart size or a gallon size bag of soil which is hard not to do because you have this whole field and one cup of soil is like a snack baggie um and you know the the lab does supply soil test bags that are pretty small if you've used them before but again um you know they don't need a lot of soil so you need to take a representative sample mix it up good and then a cup you know a cup into the bag and then um, you're sending it off to the lab i will say it can be really um tempting <laughs> especially if you have clay soil or you you have all these like sod chunks or you know it can be really tempting to kind of sort things out Okay, um, especially I see this on clay where you get you take a core and then you get those uh, core pieces that don't break apart. And it's really tempting to kind of once you mix it to push those out of the way and just take the nice broken up stuff. Hey, don't do that. Mix it up. Put a subsample of that in the bag. So don't don't official like don't sort on your own. That's not your job. Okay, um, your job is to take a representative sample, mix it up, and take a, a you know a chunk of that, a cup of that, and put it into the bag. Okay, then you got to fill out a form. The form, filling out the form is really important, especially if you want recommendations back. Um, it's also really important to us when we're trying to help people. Um, so you just you got to fill out the form. Form's really important. All right, so you send it in. Um, make sure it's properly labeled with the name of the field as you know it, um, so that when you get the samples back, you know. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've seen all these things happen, and it seems almost ridiculous to tell anybody this. But I have had people, you know, go out and soil sample, and like don't I didn't didn't have a marker um, or something to write in the bag with, and then put all the samples in their truck and then only to realize 
they did, couldn't really remember which one was from where, um, or label them one, two, three, four, <laughs> and couldn't remember which field was what. So just make sure the bags are labeled, you know, with the <laughs> so how you know the field, um, and and that will be good, so that when you get the results back, you know what they're from. All right. Uh, so now in front of us, after all of that, we have a soil test and you, you get the results back depending on the time of year, can be quick, can be slow. Um, in the fall, everybody's sending their samples in. So that's actually also when the lab tends to be really busy. So if you're in a real yank to get something back, you know, you need to think about, does, it can take time. Um, some labs are faster than others, you know. But you got to plan on at least two weeks, I would say, for the most part. Usually, that's a good time frame, about two weeks. You get the sample back, and this is what the UVM analysis looks like. So hopefully you're all looking at your own, maybe, making some notes right now as we go through this. Um, the Dairy One report is somewhat similar to this. It starts off um, with this nice graphic, you know, this... Um, chart and the chart is showing us the levels of nutrients of phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. So you can see there's only three there, um, and these are all the macronutrients like we talked about last week. Um, and they tend to show up here because they are nutrients that we require a lot of, we're looking at really closely, um, and we also have good data in Vermont to tell us that when we have a certain level of this nutrient in the soil, it means we have enough or not enough for the crop that we're growing, okay? And so that's what this graphic is showing us. So let's just um, start with phosphorus up on the top here. It's showing us that the phosphorus level in this soil, the available phosphorus, is medium. It's in the medium category. You can see it's actually kind of close to optimum. And then if we look at potassium, it's also in the medium category, but less close to optimum. And the magnesium is, it says it's high or excessive, but it's probably just high. Um, if it was all the way off the charts, then we would consider that excessive. All right, so we have these categories, low, medium, optimum, high, and excessive. And they correspond to the amount of nutrient in parts per million that have been found in your soil. So you can see a low level of phosphorus means nothing <laughs> was found up to two parts per million. So if you have low levels of phosphorus, you can see zero to two. The optimum range is generally where we want our soil nutrients to be at, okay? We want them, we want everything to be optimum, right? So you know what that means. I don't have to describe it. It means that it's at the optimum level for, for crop growth and soil productivity. So once we get into the high category and excessive, you know, that gives us an indication that we have more than we probably need when we're in the high. And when we're in the excessive, we definitely have more than what we need. And it may be dangerous, like dangerous maybe to the crop um, and maybe dangerous to the environment. So when it's in the excessive category, it's just way too much, right? So we have low, meaning that there's probably not enough there for our plants. Medium, it eh, could be enough, not quite. We probably have to do something definitely maybe about this. Optimum, we're looking pretty good. High, we probably have a little bit too much there. We should probably be managing that a little bit better. And excessive, we have way too much. Okay, so the categories are pretty simple. I wish we had them for everything, but really we, we do only have those um, breakdowns for phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. Okay, so let's talk about this a little more and what these interpretations mean, because it, it's really important and it helps us prioritize 
fertility on our farm and also helps us think about why maybe a certain crop isn't growing well <laughs> or maybe why we have a certain crop in our field. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with low. And I just should probably mention that all of this information, can we see, I gotta get this near my camera. Sorry, this is annoying. I'm sorry, it's annoying. You can't see that because it's a blurry. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the um, nutrient recommendations for field crops in Vermont. And everybody has one of these in their binder. And this is where this information is coming from. And again, I, I mentioned this the first class, it's a really good read. <laughs> it's really interesting, I guess, for people like me, but hopefully people like you too. There's a lot of details in here about soil tests and how things are measured and um, and, and why recommendations are the way they are. And so I, I do, you know, I do think it's great if for people that are interested to, to read up on it a little more. Okay, so if you have a low level of nutrient, what that means is that there is a high probability of crop response if you add the nutrient that is low, okay? And <clears throat> it should be added at the um, soil test recommendation rate, right? And if you add that amount, you will likely, right? High probability, you're gonna see a crop response. So putting your money there, right, is probably a really good idea because you're going to see a return on that investment. And when I say money, that could, you know, be the manure that you have, could be fertilizer you want to buy. But that is a good place to put nutrients because you're probably going to see a crop response. Um, usually, you know, to move from low to optimum, which is where you want to be, is going to take a lot of fertility. So you also want to stay out of that category, right? Because that means your plants, your crops are suffering to some extent. Um, and it's going to take a lot of fertilizer, you know, whether it's manure or anything else to really feed that crop and to get the soil test levels up. So, you know, you want to keep your soils out of the low category. It's going to take you a while to build that up if you are there. Um, in the case of phosphorus, which is something we're trying to manage, um, the amount that you actually need will vary on the level of aluminum, right? So the more phosphorus, you will need more phosphorus with more aluminum. And we talked about this last week, how aluminum binds with phosphorus really tightly. So if you have a lot of aluminum in your soil, it's going to hold on to that phosphorus and make it unavailable to the crop. So we have to manage that. And if that is what's keeping your phosphorus availability low, we either have to add a lot more phosphorus or we need to get a rid of some of the aluminum, right, through liming. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. Okay, if you are in the medium category, that means that you have a medium probability of crop response to adding the nutrient. So remember there was kind of that range, medium goes from, you know, 2.1 to 3.9 parts per million. If you're right on the border of low to medium, then clearly a nutrient is gonna give you a response. It's gonna be a high probability of response. But if you're on that border between medium and optimum, you may or may not see a crop response. Okay, so there's a moderate probability. Now remember, you know, building nutrient levels in the soil isn't always about just the crops either, okay? So, you know, building up that soil into the optimum range helps everything else as well. So, again, when you're trying to figure out where to invest, um, you definitely are going to get the best bang for your buck in the low category, and the bang for your buck goes down the further you get to optimum, right? The closer you get to optimum, the less investment you need to make in that soil at that moment, right? But obviously any soil can move from optimum to low, medium to low, and the other direction as well. So that's why we continual, continuously watch these things because, you know, it's 
I don't want to say it's easy to go from one to the other, but it can be. All right, so again, once you're in optimum, this is the most desirable soil test range from economics and an environmental basis. Um, there's a low probability of crop response, and what you really are trying to do once you're in this category is maintain that. So it means that you don't have to add that much every year, okay, enough to maintain those levels, um, but you don't have to overdo it. And actually, you know, if you have soils in all these different categories, you may want to take the resources that you have and invest them in the low and medium soils and, you know, take a break from the optimum soil for a year, right? So it's really um, a way to look at nutrient levels and, and investment where you haven't invested, where you should invest, um, and then maybe where you don't need to invest in the short term. So once you get into the high category, um, again, this is, you know, essentially you have a little more than you need most, you know, in most cases for the crop that you're growing. Adding more nutrient is really, it's a waste of time, effort, resources, um, and, and likely, you know, could be uh, an environmental risk as well. So again, you can see some of the nuances here like high K demanding crops uh, still may need uh, fertility when they're, even when they're in the high level, uh, usually for crops like corn um, and new seedings will recommend low levels of starter fertilizer to basically kick off um, the growth of new seedlings. So there are some nuances here, but again, you know, once you're in the high category, take take those nutrients and put them somewhere else, um, someplace that needs them. And then you have excessive. Um, and again, once you get up here, like you just don't keep putting stuff there. <laughs> you know, um, It's really a waste, really a waste. Now, something to consider in the whole scheme of what I just said is that sometimes you'll have, um, let's say, high phosphorus and low potassium. And the nutrient source you have is manure. And we already talked about, you know, what happens when we apply manure to meet the nutrient requirements um, for some other nutrient, right? Sometimes we end up over applying phosphorus and that's what's gotten us into a high category. And so, that's what we have to balance. And, and that gets really difficult, especially on organic farms, where the primary source of nutrients that we have are also organic materials, right? So even if you're gonna buy in, um, let's say poultry manure to meet some of your nutrient requirements, it also has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So it's a real balancing act, especially when you know, you only have manure as a nutrient source and our primary one, because we're constantly, you know, trying to balance nutrients to be in the optimum range with a product like manure that doesn't have equal amounts of nutrients. It's not a 10, 10, 10, you know, we're not getting the same amount of each nutrient when we add a thousand pounds, right? So that's what makes this a real puzzle um, and can make it very challenging for people to manage those, you know, different levels. So let's, oops, let's go back to the soil test. And again, um, revisit here the, the graphic and you can see phosphorus again is in the medium to optimum category. Now, if we look down in the table and we go to phosphorus, okay, so it says modified Morgan extractable parts per million. So it's telling us what extractant it used. It's telling us what the measurement unit is. So this is in parts per million. And then it says phosphorus, the value found was 3.9. The range, the optimum range, is between four parts per million and seven parts per million. 
okay? So we're at 3.9. We're basically almost optimum. So, you know, we don't need to probably add a whole lot of phosphorus. Now with potassium, you can see that the value found was 85 parts per million. And the optimum range is 100 to 130. So we also, you know, probably need to add a little bit of potassium. So that, you know, it's kind of good. We, we need to add a little bit of both. Um, you know, we're, pr we're probably pretty good on phosphorus, um, but potassium, you know, especially depending on the crop, we, we definitely want to add a little bit here too. Now, if you go down to the bottom of the page where it says recommendations, you can see for phosphorus, it's recommending 40 pounds per acre. And for potassium, it's recommending 60 pounds per acre. Okay, so it's, it's not a lot. It's, you know, I would say a, a pretty low amount for both of these. And really the goal here is to um, push, push those levels um, up to the optimum range while making sure the crop has what it needs to grow, okay? So when you're in the low and medium categories, oftentimes the recommendation is, um, will be a little bit more, it's planning for a little more than what the crop needs to start building up those levels in the soil, okay? All right. So let's go back up to the soil test and look at soil pH. That is the first thing that you'll see in the table. And it tells you the value found, which is 6.6. .6. Now we talked about pH quite a bit during our last um, visit, and we're gonna talk about it again because it's so important and it impacts so many of the nutrients um, that your crops need that we need to make sure that we address this first, okay? So this soil has a pH of 6.6, .6, and that's really good. I mean, I like to see usually 6.5 to 6.8. I think, you know, that's really a sweet spot for any of the, you know, major agricultural crops that we're growing, and um, that's, what benefits the microbes in the soil the most, as we talked about last week. It also is a nice range so that most of the other nutrients that we need are also more widely available. Um, and if, if you're below six, really, you, your soil could benefit from, you know, receiving some lime or some kind of liming agent. And I would definitely address that as soon as you can. Um, because you can keep adding nutrients, but if the pH is too low or really too high, you know, you're, you're throwing your money away um, a lot of the times. And, you know, it's just, it's such an inefficient use of your resources. So definitely pay attention to the pH on your soil test and correct that if needed. So soil pH is 6.6 .6 here. If you go back down to the recommendations, um, it says that um, our target pH of 6.2, so it determines for you, um, based on the crop that you're growing, what the target pH is. And it says, well, you don't need to add any lime. There's no lime recommended because you're already at the target pH. Um, so again, you can, you can make your own target pH, but this will, again, will provide you with a target kind of minimum for the crop um, or optimum, I guess. And then it'll recommend lime, some kind of lime uh, if you're not meeting the target. All right. So again, as we talked last week, Nutrient availability is really impacted by the pH. So you can see for some of the nutrients, when you get over seven, okay, the amount of them declines drastically in the soil. So iron, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc, um, and phosphorus. So you can see, you know, as soils become more alkaline, 
uh, more basic, higher pH, the availability of some of these nutrients go way down. Now, don't forget, we need all of these, even if we need them in tiny, tiny amounts. So, um, you know, we just want to make sure that we're, we're optimizing what we have available. Now, on the other end, once we get to acidic, we again see the decline in phosphorus availability. We start to see some declines in potassium, sulfur, obviously calcium, um, and magnesium, and sort of inefficiencies with nitrogen as well. So you can see, especially for many of the macronutrients and micronutrients too, sticking in this like slightly um, acidic range is where our nutrients are gonna be the most available. Now we have some crops um, that are very, very sensitive to pH um, and low pHs, such as you know the legume crops in particular, um, alfalfa and some of the clovers. So again, it's really important um, to keep the pH above six. Okay, so Let's talk about the other nutrients that we're seeing here and then some of the other metrics. So calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are all macronutrients. We talked about this uh, last week. And you can see there's an optimum range for magnesium, but there is not an optimum range for calcium or actually any of the micronutrients. You can kind of see these stars, which is the average um, that we see in the state. So we on average see um, sulfur levels of 11 and your farm had 11. So if you're kind of way outside of the average, maybe either way, it may you know behoove us to think about what, why that's happening. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have or will have a micronutrient deficiency. And I'm going to talk about micronutrient deficiencies in the last class um, because there are, you know, certain soil types, certain situations um, where we where we do see micronutrient deficiencies, and we need to make sure to be adding micronutrients to the soil. But in many cases, especially um, on farms that have livestock, that feed minerals, that feed grain, there's usually a lot of micronutrients that are coming through the manure applications. So we worry less about that um, on many of our livestock operations, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be evaluate, evaluating um, you know, our soil test. So, if you are a livestock producer, it's also really important to look at your forage test and try to link up these two. If we're seeing something micronutrient deficient, we think in the soil um, and in the soil test, and you have a forage test to go along with that, it would be really helpful to help us decide, you know, is there something that we should be doing? Um, there are certain micronutrients that, you know, tend to be difficult to meet, you know, in um, growing forages and growing crops, which is why we add minerals um, to many livestock rations. But again, you know, there are levels in your forages and we have levels in your soil. So if, if there's cause for concern, you know, we can talk about that and talk about a strategy, but, you know, we deal with those very differently than the macronutrients. Uh, as far as, calcium and magnesium go, you will get recommendations for those. With calcium in particular, if the calcium level is low, you will get a recommendation for lime, right? Because calcium is um, impacts whether a soil is alkaline or whether it's acidic. So if your pH is really low, your calcium level will likely be low, and then there'll be a recommendation for lime. And lime, like limestone, is calcium carbonate, right? So you would be adding calcium through lime. Some people choose to add lime 
or add calcium for other reasons. Um, but again, if you need calcium, it should show up as a Lyme uh, recommendation. Okay, magnesium. Again, if you are low in magnesium, it will give you a recommendation for magnesium. And I recommend that you follow that. Um, you know, again, it's just something we don't think about that often, but when you need it and it's showing up on your soil tests, you better be adding it because it can severely impact not just the productivity of your crop, but the health of your livestock. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, again, we can, we'll talk about this later, but that balance of calcium, magnesium, and potassium in the soil is directly related to the balance in your uh, feed, in the forage, which then can directly impact, you know, the health of your animals. And that is one really um, <laughs> like clear connection that we know between soil, forages, and livestock health. So I think anybody who has livestock knows about milk fever, knows about grass tetany, all of those kind of ailments are related to the amount of calcium, magnesium, and potassium that an animal is getting at critical times. And that is often, you know, a result of what is in or not in the diet that they're getting, which for most of our cows is primarily forages, right? So these things really matter in your soil. Um, and keeping them in balance is actually important, uh, really important because of, you know, not just crop productivity, but at the end of the day, animal health. Okay, so if you need magnesium, you'll get a recommendation. Now, we do have soils in Vermont that are, um, you know, their genetic material, I guess, or the way they were formed and the rocks that they formed from, um, means that they're naturally high in magnesium or naturally high in calcium. So you can see this field is high in calcium. This is actually is a sample from um, from North Hero from the islands. And, and like I said, the Champlain Valley tends to be really high in calcium. Um, it's an old it's old ocean bed, right? Um, so, but once we get out of the Champlain Valley and start to work our way up into the hills of Vermont, what we see is less calcium and more acids, more aluminum, okay? But again, this field is high in calcium and it's low in aluminum. If you go over and look at aluminum, it's only 27 parts per million, all right? So the soil test, again, gives you this level of nutrients. Um, it's really important to look at everything. If you're feeling concerned about something that you're seeing, communicate with us and we can help explain it better um, and explain it or talk about if we think you need to, to do something. Two common micronutrients that we do see deficient in Vermont very regularly are boron and zinc. Um, and both of these uh, um, are prone to leaching, okay? So they don't stick to the soil very well and, and they leach. Um, sulfur is another one that, that does as well, but we commonly, commonly see boron deficiencies in Vermont, um, especially on legume fields, okay? Legumes uh, take a lot of boron and if you have a field that has a good amount of legume in it, um, then generally there is a recommendation for boron, okay? Because we just assume actually that it's deficient. <laughs> um, so it's it's a blanket recommendation. We, we don't even test for it, really. We just recommend that people add it at a very small amount um, if they're growing a legume crop. All right, the other nutrient is zinc. It's also a nutrient that we uh, find to be deficient uh, in many Vermont soils, and we do recommend zinc often, um, especially for certain grasses like corn. 
corn takes a lot of zinc. And so we will make zinc recommendations uh, if the soil test um, indicates that we should. Okay, but those are really the only two that we commonly make recommendations for. And again, these are very low levels. Um, we're talking about a pound per acre um, or eight pounds per acre. So for most people, it becomes difficult to put that on the field. And we can talk about that, you know, a little bit later. Okay, so again, you see aluminum here. And in this soil, it's 27 parts per million. That's considered very low when we get up into the hundreds <laughs> or 100, 200 part per million range. That's when you start to see the pH really go down often, okay? Because aluminum is an acid. Hydrogen is an acid. Those are the elements that make your soil acidic. And in the Northeast, our acidity in mo many of our soils is driven by the amount of aluminum, all right? And alkalinity or bases, okay? So what makes the soil basic or higher in pH are bases. So we have the acids, and we have the bases. Does this sound like something you learned in school at some point? Okay, so the acids in our soil are aluminum and hydrogen. So the more of those that you have, generally, the more acidic your soil is and the less bases you have, okay? So the bases, what makes your soil basic, more alkaline, and higher in pH are potassium is a base, calcium is a base, magnesium is a base. Okay, those are the primary bases. So if you have a lot of bases in your soil, you generally have lower acids and you have a higher pH. If you have more aluminum and hydrogen, you have a more acidic pH, and you have less bases, less calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Okay, it's kind of that it doesn't sound simple, but that's what it is. So go over to the right hand side of the soil test, and you will see effective CEC, this is the cation exchange capacity. We talked about this a little bit last week, okay? In milla equivalents per 100 gram of soil, and you see this number here is 14.1, okay? And then below that, you see base saturation in percent, okay? So base saturation, the bases in your soil are calcium, potassium, and magnesium, right? We just talked about this. The bases in your soil, what makes your soil basic and less acidic, more alkaline, are calcium, potassium, and magnesium. Base saturation, are you ready? Is the percentage of the exchange sites cation exchange capacity, the percentage of the exchange sites, okay, that have bases, calcium, potassium, magnesium, attached to them. 91.9% of the exchange sites on this soil are covered with calcium, okay? So most of all the exchange sites have calcium on them. 1.6%
much, 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 much smaller, right? Of the exchange sites have potassium on it. And six and a half percent of the exchange sites have magnesium. So if you add this all up, right, we have, let's see, 92 plus uh, six and a half plus 1.6, we almost have 100%. Um, now, what's on the rest of the sites? Are there sites that have aluminums on it? Aluminum, okay. There are some sites that have aluminum on it, but not very much, if any, barely, okay. All right, so the base saturation is the percentage of the exchange sites that have calcium, potassium, or magnesium. And when these numbers are high, it should relate directly back to the soil pH, okay? And that the soil pH, if these numbers are high, the soil pH should be high, correct? Because these are bases. This is what makes your soil basic. So if you only had 20% calcium and these same other numbers, this pH would be very low because the rest of those exchange sites would likely be covered with acids, okay? Okay, so let's go back to cation exchange capacity. So we're talking about the exchange sites, okay? Cation exchange capacity. So what's a cation? Okay, a cation is a positively charged nutrient. So do you remember this from last week? We said some of them are positively charged and some of them are negatively charged. So the positively charged nutrients, right, get bound to the negative sites on the soil. So the cations are the ones with the plus sign. They have a positive charge. Okay, so the cation exchange capacity is the ability for your soil or for your soil to hold on to those positively charged nutrients. So this 14.1 kind of represents the number of negative exchange sites. So the higher this number is, the more exchange sites there are, okay? The more negative um, exchange sites to hold on to positively charged nutrients. So this is a pretty high number, 14.1, okay? We usually like to see like 10 to 12. So if you remember from last time, the negative charges come from clay, and organic matter. So looking at this soil, okay, 14.1, and looking at the percent organic matter, 3.3, .3, which is okay, should be higher actually. I mean, we, we'd like to see this around four. <laughs> but anyway, so most of the exchange sites here, they're probably coming from clay. This is probably has a lot of clay in it or a good amount. When we see 14, 15, 16, 18, 20, we assume there's quite a bit of clay, okay? Um, so clay has more charge, the more clay you have, the higher that, um, the higher the number of exchange sites. All right, so cations are positively charged nutrients. Calcium, potassium, magnesium are all positively charged nutrients. And so is an aluminum. And so is an hydrogen. Okay. So they all get stuck on this on the exchange sites. But what the soil test is telling us is that most of those exchange sites have bases on them. And again, that's just telling us probably the pH is high. Okay. It does give you some ranges here of what we're kind of looking for. 
And it is important to look at these ranges here. They they do mean something. <laughs> um, and But they generally do still reflect back to the soil test and also the recommendations. So we know potassium is a bit low, right? Um, and it is recommending us to add potassium. And if we do, they'll probably be more on the exchange sites as well, because we do want to kind of try to be in this two to seven range, okay? All right, so that is pretty much everything on this soil test. The soil organic matter percent, we'll, we'll talk more about organic matter next week. But um, the percent organic matter is really important. It's really important for you to be evaluating and looking at, and it impacts a lot of things in the soil, nutrient availability, water holding capacity, uh, et cetera. But um, I will say that, you know, in most soils, we wanna see that level around four, if not higher. Um, in, in sandy, sandy soils, we expect that number to be low. We we hope that it's two two percent, <laughs> okay. But in a clay soil, you know this should definitely be about four. I, my assumption, looking at this soil, is that it's probably a silty clay soil. It's probably been tilled up a lot. It's been in tillage with that low organic matter, and maybe not a lot of um, manure coming back to the field. All right, so just before we look at some more information, uh, a couple other things on here. We, we've referred to the recommendations a few times. Again, in order to get recommendations on your soil test, you have to fill out the form. You have to put what crop it is. Um, you're, you're asked about your yields. Um, how many cuttings, some of your management. And then based on that, the lab will provide you recommendations for that field, okay? So if you don't fill it out accurately or you don't fill it out at all, you won't, you won't get recommendations or you won't get the right ones. So it's important to look at what you put here <laughs> or somebody else to make sure that it's, um, that it accurately reflects what you're doing. Now in Go Crop, it'll actually fill in a recommendation for you based on the crop that you're going to grow and the yields, etc. So you don't necessarily need the information from here. Um, but again, I if you're going to fill out the form, do it do it correctly. Okay. So it says here the crop that we're growing is a small grain, you know, it's oats, rye, it's something, it's some kind of small grain. Um, and it says to grow that crop, this is the recommendation of additional nutrients that you should be adding to obtain um, some certain yield, okay? So usually you're selecting a yield value when you fill out the form. So you can see here, there's a lime recommendation, which is nothing. There's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There's no magnesium recommendation. Um, there's, there's nothing else here except for these three. And what this is saying is this level of nutrient should be added to meet the growing needs of the crop. And again, like I said, to help shift these nutrients a little bit closer to optimum. Now, um, you can add these nutrients however you see fit, okay? Um, or not add them at all, that's really your decision. But, um, you know, we will be, if you're using manure, what we're gonna figure out is how much manure you need to add to get this amount of nutrients. And if you're using fertilizers, purchase fertilizers will do the same thing. So this doesn't mean that you put on 60 pounds of um, muriate of potash, right? This is just saying the crop needs 60 pounds total of nutrient, K2O. Um, nitrogen 
it says this crop needs 60 pounds per acre, but nowhere up here, right? In any of the things we talked about, did we say the nitrogen level from the soil test is, right? So where the heck is this coming from? We're gonna take a whole class and talk about nitrogen <laughs> because it's really probably the most complicated uh, nutrient that we deal with. Um, and it, it's the most difficult to deal with. It's subject to all kinds of transformations and losses. And it's all really biologically driven and really heavily influenced by the weather. So we don't measure it on a soil test because it changes so fast and it's here today, gone tomorrow. Um, and so we can't really take one measurement in time like we do with these other nutrients and use it for three years. Like that is not at all how nitrogen works. So the recommendations that we give and that you get on a soil test are based on yields, soil type, um, and some other factors. So, so they're actually a, a more loose estimate of what we think you'll need to grow a crop. We're not measuring nitrogen necessarily in the soil like we do with all the other nutrients. And we'll dig into that a lot more next week. Um, but just in case you're wondering, I'm sure everybody was wondering <laughs> where, where that comes from. Okay, so let's recap here a little bit um, and just go through some of these principles, you know, using images so that you can better understand all, all the different pieces. So here's a, a figure graphic um, to describe cation exchange capacity, the CEC, okay? So over here to the left, we have a soil that has a cation exchange capacity of 25. And it says more clay, more positions to hold cations. So remember, we're talking about a negative charge on the soil that is uh, clay, generally driven by clay, and organic matter content, that's not listed here, which is really important when you get into the sandier soils, okay? But you can see with the clay, when there's more clay, you get more negative binding sites. More positions for positively charged nutrients. Here they are. Now the one not listed here, because this is not from the Northeast, is aluminum, okay? Aluminum has a positive charge as well. So here are these positively charged nutrients and they can bind on to the negative binding sites and be held there, okay? Which keeps us from losing them into, into the groundwater, um, into the atmosphere, sometimes, you know, even to our plants, but that's a whole different story. But it allows our soil to kind of hold on to the nutrients kind of loosely for the most part and exchange those onto and off from the binding sites as you know the weather and crops and drawdown of nutrients occurs okay for many of the nutrients it really is about trying to keep things in balance between the soil and the soil solution right which is where the roots get the nutrients from they get it out of the soil solution they're not plucking it off the soil they draw it out of the soil solution, which creates a differential, okay? And oftentimes with that differential, nutrients will move off from the soil into the soil solution. Not quite that simple, but more or less that's how it works. Okay, so now you go over to the other soil here with a cation exchange capacity of five, and it's saying, well, this is low clay content and fewer positions to hold cations. Okay, so you can see we have fewer positions here, uh, less clay. And if you look at the CEC range, 50 cation exchange capacity would be a soil with very, very heavy clay, and a zero cation exchange capacity would be 100% sand. Okay, no organic matter, 
the only way to get exchange is to add organic matter in that situation, right? Okay, so then you look at some characteristics here um, around both of these types of soils. So when you have a high cation exchange capacity, um, you have a greater capacity to hold nutrients. Usually you have a more fertile soil. Um, they're easier to kind of manage in a way. Um, usually you do need more lime though to correct pH um, because you have to drive the, the acids off from these binding sites. So basically you have more buffering capacity. So it's a little bit harder to change the pH um, once you have more negative sites. So um, when you have less negative binding sites, you know, you, you don't need as much lime if the soil's acidic, um, but nutrients leach more easily and we're not able to hold on to them as well. So, you know, middle of the ground is good. <laughs> All right. So here's my little picture I like to use so you can see the aluminum on the soil. So here's our, our clay soil. You can see all the binding sites that I made, so beautiful. Um, you can see there's calcium, there's aluminum, potassium, sodium, ammonium. So we do hold on to nitrogen, uh, magnesium, two plus. All right, so here are the bases and the acids hanging on to the soil. What I want you to notice over here is nitrate, NO3 minus, right? Opposites attract, but when we have these negatively charged nutrients like nitrates, um, sulfur compounds, um, boron, you know, there's a whole host of them, they're highly prone to leaching, right? Because there's nothing that's really going to pick them up and hold them and keep them from kind of falling out through the soil. Now, there are uh, positive binding sites on the soil, but those are a lot fewer, so few that we don't even talk about it, really. Um, but that's called the anion exchange capacity. And again, it, it, it's not a huge influence in most agricultural soils. So, you know, we don't really talk about it much. But again, that's why it's, it's hard to hold on to nitrates because there's nothing that can kind of grab them and, and hold on to them. Okay, so just again, we talked about these pluses. We have two plus, three plus, one plus. Now the more pluses, the more tightly bound to the soil that nutrient is, okay? So the potassium and the sodium and the ammonium and the hydrogens, they're loosely bound. They kind of, are, they're dangling off of your soil. They move on to and off from these binding sites very easily. You know, in fact, potassium is very prone to leaching because of that. It actually just sort of moves on and off. It's not held on very tightly. It's easily outcompeted, right, by the stronger nutrients. So aluminum, you can see, has a three plus. So what that should be telling you is that it is held on to the soil very, very, very tightly, more than anything else. And so remember last week when we were talking about phosphorus has that H2PO4 minus, I'm sure everybody <laughs> memorized that. Um, that minus on the potassium binds to this aluminum, okay? And it binds to this calcium very tightly. Now, if you have high aluminum soils, it is like sucking up that phosphorus and then it gets bound really tightly to the soil. So if you have a lot of aluminum, it can be really hard to get rid of because it is bound so tightly there and it's binding your phosphorus. So you kind of got, you got to break all that up in order to get the pH up, but also to get some free uh, phosphorus. So how do, how do we do that? How do we change the pH? So how do we get rid of the aluminums or the hydrogens, right? Hydrogens are easy to get rid of. They only have that one plus, so it's not hard to get rid of them. So we add calcium, we add lime. There's different types of liming agents, but the important thing is that we're adding enough to be able to drive off, right? So kick out, 
pick those other nutrients off of those binding sites. So we have to add enough calcium to break this, which means we have to just really overwhelm the system with lime. So if you have high aluminum soils, you may have a lime recommendation of six tons to the acre because that's how much you need to displace all that aluminum. Okay, if you only have a lot of hydrogens, you probably need a ton. It doesn't take that much because it's weak, right? So again, paying attention to the aluminum, the calcium, the bases, the acids, all on that soil test will help us determine, you know, what kind of lime to use, how much of it, um, and how to manage all, all of these nutrients in our soil. Did anybody think it was that complicated? <laughs> So the soil test can tell us a lot of things, um, you know, a lot of things it can't, but it really gives us a like good insight um, to, you know, what's happening in the soil and, and how we can manage some of that, um, you know, from adding nutrients, but we can pick up other things as well that are really critical. And, and I hope going through this um, gave you a little bit better understanding of how to read a soil test and, and how to approach them. Um, again, looking back at this book will, you know, help you further understand everything uh, so that, you know, we can do a good job managing the nutrients in our soil. All right, so I know it's noon and I think I'm, I'm gonna quit there and go to Go Crop to show you your homework. I do want to go down. I put a manure test in here somewhere. I got to find that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. All right. So we're going to work on putting the your manure test into Go Crop today. And also, also you know, essentially your manure storages with their associated uh, analysis. Right? So if you don't have an analysis, you haven't done one for your farm, or you think it's not correct, which often happens, you can use the book values. There are book values, which are kind of, you know, basically an average of manure tests that have been sent in to the lab um, in nutrient recommendations for field crops. So you can use those but it's really highly advisable um, and also a requirement to be sampling every manure storage on your farm every year. So you have to have one sample per storage. And again, a storage can be a stack, it can be a bedded pack, it can be a you know manure uh, pit from a manure pit. If you have three pits, they all have to be sampled separately. We wanna know what's, in this material, you know, in the manure that you're putting on your field. How else will we know how to meet the needs of your crops if we don't know what we're putting on the ground? Um, so that's that's why we want you to take a sample. It's hard to get a good sample, so sometimes it takes time to really learn how to do it well and get a good representative sample. Um, a lot of people now, especially custom applicators, are used to taking samples or helping take samples for people. Uh, <clears throat> manure analysis, same thing, can be done at UVM, can be done through Dairy One, um, you know, but it, it has to be done. Again, you're taking one sample to represent a lot of material. So, you know, be thinking about that. And that's why a good sample is important. With liquid manure, of course, if you take it in the spring and you have all the rainwater, you know, it's not necessarily, or melted snow, it may not necessarily be reflective of exactly what you're spreading all year. So you wanna, you know, try to get a, a representative sample if you're only gonna take and use one sample a year because it can inf influence what we do quite considerably. So here's a picture of a manure test. Um, again, it's out of the nutrient recommendations for field crops. You can see the manure test lists the nutrients. It lists some micronutrients as well. As I was saying before, we do get you know, a good amount of micronutrients in manure. Um, this is listed in pounds per ton. 
wet ton or pounds per thousand gallons. So obviously, depending on what type of manure it is, will really de um, depend on which one of these columns you use, right? So if if it's out of a manure pit, liquid pit, you're obviously going to use pounds per thousand gallons. That's how you spread the manure. Um, if it's a dry manure, bedded pack, or you know stacked, you got or daily spread it's pounds per wet ton. So those are the numbers that you'll put into go go crop. So again, you get a total nitrogen number, um, which is the total, and then you get ammonium nitrogen which is a part of the total, right? And then you get organic nitrogen, which is the other part of the total, okay? So you will put ammonium nitrogen and organic nitrogen into go crop, and it will add those up for you. And I'll show you this in a minute. It gives you phosphorus as P2O5. It gives you potassium as K2O. Now, this is really important because it sometimes... If you're sending a manure sample elsewhere, they'll give you other numbers here, not as P205. Now, how we look at this in nutrient management plan, you need to enter the number um, in the P205 form. I'm not going to get into why or what the difference is. That's just what you need to do. Okay. Then you have calcium, magnesium, sodium, and the micronutrients. There are certain components that we require you to add in to go crop for nutrient management planning. I'll show you those in a second. You're welcome to add in everything here if you want <clears throat> and be tracking that. I think it's a good thing. But um, in the least, you need to add nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, okay, I am getting out of here. We're going to go to go, go crop, and I'm going to show you your homework. And then we'll break for lunch. Let's see here. Where is your homework? I have so many windows open. I can't find the window. <laughs> Where is the window? Somewhere up here. Yes. I got to get. Sorry, folks. Let me just, I just got to go back to go crop here. All right. Okay. So hopefully every time I go to this, it's starting to look more familiar to you and you're, you know, successfully navigating go crop and, um, not too confused if I'm entering this way instead of right from the right from the start. But you're looking at the dashboard again. Remember over to the left here, it gives you these icons. And then if you pull away a little bit, you see dashboard, nutrient sources, and equipment. So last time we entered in um, equipment, I had you enter in your manure spreaders that you have. And today we're going to add in your nutrient sources. So this is fertilizers that you're using and also manure that you're using on your farm. So you can see I already have a manure storage that I put in here. And so I'm going to go into that first and then we'll enter a new one. <clears throat> All right. So... The, on the top, you have the manure source details, okay, which talks about, you know, what it, what it is, what you call it, um, the type of manure that's being held there, um, you know, is it from cows, beef, etc.? Is it liquid? Is it solid? And then how much? And this is the part that you'll probably need some help on. Um, so you're adding in the name, so whatever you call this storage, you can add in, you know, this year if you want or last year, just doesn't really matter. Um, is the manure imported? Yes or no? So if you're importing manure, you need to account for that. If you're buying chicken manure or you're getting manure from a neighbor, you have to account for it in your plan. 
even if you're not storing it on your farm, you know, you're not taking manure and putting it into a pit, you're getting manure from somebody else's pit and you're putting it onto your fields, you got to build that into your plan. If you're buying poultry manure from Jeru's, you know, you, can, you need to add that as a manure source and how many tons you're buying or applying <clears throat> because we're going to draw down from that when we write your plan, the rest of your plan. Okay, so in here, you're putting the name, included scents, imported or not, the type of, of manure that it is. So you can see there's a whole bunch of selections here. Um, is it liquid, semi-solid or solid? Okay, so this is a liquid storage. And then what's the estimated annual total? Now these numbers, you know, usually are generated for you. Um, and I'm, you know, well, you should have these numbers from the technical person that you've been working with. It, it is an estimate. Um, we do have a kind of a program that will help estimate the total production. When we're talking about a like a liquid pit, we're not just talking about the amount of manure that the cows are producing. We're talking about how much rainwater is going in there, how much bedding. You may have gray water or, you know, something from the milk house, et cetera. So we need to account for all of that in the total. Some of you have really good records of manure spreading, um, and, and we definitely can use those, but there's got to be some document in your plan that shows how you came up with that total uh, volume. Of, of spreading. So again, hopefully, you know, you, whoever you're working with has helped you calculate that. If not, um, we can help you with that. Okay. So again, you're going to add in each storage. <clears throat> and once you have the storage and the quantity in there, then you want to add the uh, analysis. Right, so I've already added this one in. You put the lab and the test date, <clears throat> and then you put in the dry matter, and then you put in the nutrients. So again, you're only adding the inorganic nitrogen, the ammonium nitrogen, organic nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and you can see here I added in the copper level. You can add in everything you want, um, but you have to add in these first four. And you can see on the top here, it says total nitrogen, 25 pounds per thousand gallons. So you don't add, you don't put in the total N, it will add that up for you. All right, so let me get back out of here. So again, you're just gonna hit add manure. You're gonna uh, stack two, Let's put last year, imported I'm gonna say no and it's uh, let's just say it's calves it's solid and I'm producing 300 tons a year so then I'm gonna save it once I save it you can see there's a this uh, section here to add an analysis okay so I'm gonna do that Put the test date, the lab, if you have a space for notes, the dry matter, it's gonna be a lot higher, right? And then it says ammonium nitrogen, it's gonna put two, organic nitrogen, phosphorus, <clears throat> and potassium. Now, if you wanna add more than this, Add another row, and then oh, I'm I want to put in the sulfur levels. Okay, and you can add them all in if you want, and then you just hit save, and that's it. So you need to add in each nutrient source that's on your farm. Now, if you're buying in fertilizers and you have certain fertilizers that you're already using. Same process here, you say add a fertilizer. I'm gonna call this my corn starter. 
It's a dry fertilizer. Okay, save it. And then you put in the analysis, which is the percent nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Again, if you're adding magnesium, just add another row or zinc. Sometimes there's zinc in, in the um, corn starter. And then you put in the analysis. And then you save it. Okay. Now there's lots of options here. If you are buying in, I don't like a bagged um, organic fertilizer, let's say like Pro Grow or something. Okay, so a bagged organic fertilizer that includes, you know, kind of has poultry manure, blood meal, I don't know, all kinds of stuff in it. Um, you might say, um, I'm buying this fertilizer and it's an organic amendment. It's not synthetic, right? So I'm gonna buy, it. I'm gonna hit that. And then when I go into the analysis, it's going to ask me the same questions it's going to ask me the analysis, which if it's a bagged product, it should have one, okay? And then below here, it has a, a whole different section where it asks you, um, or it puts a nitrogen mineralization rate. And this is here because it's an organic nitrogen product and it breaks down slowly. It's not like buying urea, okay? So we're accounting for that. And you can change this number if you want, but generally this is a, a good estimate if you don't know. So then you just save that, okay? So that's it. If you don't know what fertilizers you're using or you don't know yet, you don't have to add them in, but if you know, just go ahead and put them in. Okay, so that's part of your homework. The other part this week is to go to fields. And now we're going to uh, put in the crops and the rotation. So I'm gonna go here to the small field. Okay, last week you put in the soils, right? You put in the Vermont NMP details here. You got all that in there. This week, you're gonna enter soil tests. We're gonna enter rotation over here and we're gonna enter crops, okay? So if you have your soil test values in a spreadsheet, Lindsay's going to show you how to upload those here in a second. Um, but if you don't and you just have single tests and they're on paper, um, you're going to have to enter each one of those individually. So you just hit add a soil test. You put the date that it was sampled, not the date that you got the test back, the date it was sampled. You can put the lab. Okay. And then you just fill out the results off from the soil test. So I'm just filling it out from our last test we just looked at. Uh, and, and 85 and 27. Okay. And same thing here. If you want to add in the micronutrients or you want to add in magnesium, um, or all of them, you know, everything there, go ahead. It's really up to you. Okay, but in the minimum, you have to have phosphorus, potassium, and aluminum, and organic matter, pH, and CEC. So once you add in your soil test, hit save. There it is, okay. And it shows up here in the information section. Right. So I'm going to um, show you the other two pieces and then Lindsay will show you how to upload if you want to upload your soil test. OK, so you also need to fill out rotation this week if you haven't done it yet. OK, so what you can see here is when you go to the rotation for that field, you should have already put in the T value for the soil type of this field. What you are going to enter here is the 
estimated soil loss predicted through Russell 2 for each field on your farm. Okay, you're going to enter the rotation soil loss. And if applicable, you're going to add soil loss from each year in the rotation. Okay, so you hit edit. Okay, so this is where it says average soil loss. This is the average of the entire rotation. If you don't rotate and it's always grass all the time, okay, that is your rotation soil loss. That's the average soil loss um, for the rotation and for every year. Okay, it doesn't diff differ. So the average soil loss, let's say, is for this field is 2.2. So then you have to add in the rotation. If this is a hay field that is always hay and it's not being reseeded, then you're going to have one number. Okay, so this is grass hay established. You're going to have one soil loss number. And let's say it's, I said it was 2.2 up there. I should probably just say 0 0.2. Okay, it's going to be the same. Okay, so you may have one number. Lucky you, if you only have one number. That means you're all grass all the time. So you put that in here, you put it in both spots, and then you hit current year. Okay, then you're done because it's always grass all the time. You never work it up, you never change crops. That's what it is. The rotation and the yearly loss is the same. You got to check current year and make sure if you have an actual rotation, it's the right year. And then you just hit update. Okay, so that's simple enough. Then you're going to go into crops and you're going to fill out the crop for that field this year. Okay, so we just said this was a hay field, so we'll stick with that. So it says, is it an annual or perennial? Well, it's a hay field, it's perennial. What is the crop? So let's see here um, hay crop. Is it harvested? Is it grazed? Is it a cover crop? Um, it's, it's grazed. Um, and let's see, I also hay it. I do both. Okay, so then it's going to ask you what percentage of legume is it? And you have to fill this out even if it's zero. Okay, so I'm going to say, well, it's 20%. It's a hay field. So what percentage of the field is covered with plants, okay? Do you see, do you see soil or not? And it gives you a little indicator here. It says, if you don't know this number, you can use 15 for low coverage crops like corn, or you can use 80 for high coverage crops like hay, okay? So I'm, I'll probably use 80. It's a really good stand. And then it asks you about cultural practices. You know, you can fill this out. This is more helpful to us than anything when we're reviewing plans. Um, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put anything. I mean, I could put no-till, it's a hay field, I guess. All right, so then it asks me, when, when was this field established? Ugh, I don't know, it's always, it's always been hay. I guess I'll just, I'll put 2022. So it says, well, is this a reseeding year? Well, obviously not, so no. Are you gonna get more than one harvest? Yes. I'm gonna get two hay cuttings and then I'm gonna graze it. So how much yield are you gonna get from the hay? Well, two cuttings, I'll probably get a ton and a half of hay. Dry matter, okay? You're doing this in dry matter, so I'll get tons, tons per acre. All right, so then it asked me about grazing. Yikes, uh, I'll probably just graze it once, probably just once. And then from that one graze, I don't know, maybe I'll get, a, I'll probably get a ton, ton of dry matter off that one graze. Do, do, do. Okay, and then you save it. That's it, okay? So it's telling you you're harvesting hay and you're grazing. 
So this is where having an estimate of your yields becomes very important. Um, and again, if you're haying it all, that's great. If you're grazing it all, that's great. If you're doing both, you can put that in as well. Um, and yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, let's go to a different field quick. That one's hay too. I don't want to, I guess I can, I'll go into your field, Lindsay. <clears throat> I'm going to add a rotation now. This is a corn field. Okay. So the average across the corn and the hay years is 2.2. Okay, I'm growing corn silage with a cover crop. In the first year of the rotation, that is, um, let's see, 0.5 soil loss. The second year of the rotation is one. The third year of the rotation, you can see it's going up. This should all be on your papers you guys have. Uh, so two. Okay, and then I'm seeding back down. I only have three years of corn. And then I'm gonna do new, new hay field, 2.9. And then it's gonna be hay for three more years. So you can see this could take a while. <laughs> you rotate a lot, which is good. Don't wanna keep people from rotating. Um, but it takes longer to fill out each field if you have a lot of years in your rotation, okay? All right, so here's my rotation. That's the average. Here's each year, and I'm in the third year of corn. And that's it. You update that. Now I go to crops. See here, you can go right from here. I'm going to add it. It's an annual corn, I'm harvesting it. Uh, I don't really need to put anything here. It's not much surface cover and it doesn't overwinter and I only get one harvest. And for my corn crop, it's 25 tons to the acre. Okay. So I've showed you annual crops, perennial crops, pasture, or grazing and harvest. There's all different scenarios you may run, run across and you need help, so please reach out. And with that, I'm turning it over to you, Lindsay. Maybe. I am. I'm oh, coming, gosh. just okay. slowly. Moving, moving things up. This is a heavy computer. It's a a bit of a struggle to move it over here. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Thank you. Okay, so when you are um, uploading some soil test information. Heather had already shown you if you're going to manually enter it. Um, so if you received your soil test information in um, <laughs> an Excel file through an email, the first thing that you're going to want to do is to download it to your computer. And um, then you will, are going to want to open it up because chances are that is chances are that you received it as an Excel file um, and we need to convert this to a csv file so to do that you'll go to file save as browse and place it wherever it is you'd like to i'm going to keep it in downloads you might have a folder that's specific to this year or to your nutrient management plan so you might want to save it there and then whereas it says save as type excel workbook we're going to scroll down here we're going to open up our drop down and we are going to change this to a csv file there's a bunch of different types of CSV files, um, Macintosh, MS-DOS, we just want this one right here. You can change your um, file name if you'd like. I'm gonna keep mine the same and I'm gonna save it here. And we're gonna say, yep, I know I'm gonna lose some of my features, but that's okay. Now I'm gonna close this out. Um, click save just for the fun of it, keep on saving click the yes, go through the cycle. Mm -hmm. It's okay. All right, now we're out of it. And we're gonna go into go crop. 
Um, chances are you might already be in there. I'm gonna click with work with this farm. And you'll scroll down on your dashboard and you'll come to import data. You'll click new import. And then there will be some options in this dropdown of um, what format you are going to upload your data from. So if you received your information from the UVM Agricultural and Environmental Testing Lab, you'll choose from UVM Soil Lab. If you received your file from a different organization, you can download a template and upload it through that. And if that is the case, um, feel free to reach out directly and I can help set you up with the workbook that's gonna make the most sense to streamline um, importing your soil test results. So once you get from the soil test lab, um, you choose that and you choose your file. Um, I saved mine in downloads. And I think one thing that I wanna point out here is that remember we had two files in our download, the Excel workbook and the CSV. Um, because GoCrop only recognizes a CSV file, that those are the only types of files that will show up in whatever folder that you're in to import your results. Open this. And um, we have three fields. I have three soil tests. You might have more fields um, that you sampled than you have in your soil test results. You'll be able to link those up. Um, and if you have a situation where you might have taken multiple soil tests for the same field because it's over 20 acres, you can manipulate your CSV file to have an average of those two and have that be the direct link up as well. I think one thing to note is using this process, you can only import one soil test for um, each field at a time. So you can't upload multiple soil tests for one field. So I'm gonna move this out of the way here. Um, now that we've chosen our um, import template and our file, we'll click next step. And this is really easy because we have three fields. So that's all that we display here. But if there are more fields, there'll be a way to scroll down and look at that. Um, we are going to ignore the lab ID. Some of these pieces that um, GoCrop shows here are things that we don't necessarily need to change. I'll kind of point them out a little bit, but I won't dive too far deep into that. But what I do want to show here is that on the left, it is displaying the name that was put, that was submitted to the soil test lab. On the right in the drop down menu are the fields as written in GoCrop. And you can see that GoCrop tries to match up whatever was um, on the soil test submission form or in your soil test results with whatever you put into GoCrop. So here we have 12-1. That's because that was the track and field number identified for field behind the barred in go crop. Here we have small field directly linked with small field in go crop. Here we have river field and go crops like, I don't understand exactly what that is. There's not a one for one match. I can't quite parse that out. And that's for a couple of reasons. In go crop, we named it field by river and there's a small spelling error. So the, the system didn't know how to connect that, but you can connect that by opening up this drop down menu and saying, yes, this is correct. If you think that there might have been a, an issue in some of your other field names and um, match, matching up, you can always just correct them here um, if you'd like. So these now, um, remember when we opened up the um, Excel workbook or the CSV file and there was a bunch of different rows and um, columns? In GoCrop, you don't need all of the columns. Like you don't need the order number. Um, you do need the date. Um, so that's why these are connected here and says skip this column um, to go into GoCrop. In general, I would say you don't need to look through all of these. Um, GoCrop is automatically going to import the nutrients or the other indicators that are required to meet nutrient management planning requirements. Um, in the event that you want other nutrients also, Connecting into GoCrop, please reach out and I'll show you how to do that. Um, I will say that sometimes the more you add, the more your nutrient balance table and your nutrient balance um, planning tab can get a little bit um, can get a little bit more complicated because you'll have a lot more columns potentially. So I'm just going to say I want to keep all my defaults as they are, just trying to meet my nutrient management plan requirements, and so I'm going to click preview with these settings. And now GoCrop says, hey. You have all your fields, all the information that you need, and you're ready to import. 
occasionally, um, you know, I might be working with somebody or you might see this yourself where um, you might have a result that um, you don't have a field matched up for. And if that's the case, you can just say, I'm going to skip this. I'm not importing this result and that's okay. And that'll be, I think, pretty intuitive. But if you do see that and have any questions, feel free to reach out. But just from there, it's just click import. And it'll take a moment um, to import the results. Kind of depends sometimes on how many you have. And we'll just wait here for a moment. Um, in general, this has been a really great um, feature that helps save a lot of time and kind of helps also oops, um, ensure accuracy of um, results in, put into GoCrop versus manual entry field by field. So just to double check, because we always like to make sure that we were able to do what we tried to do, we'll go into our fields and we'll look at one of our fields here, look at field behind barn, and we'll scroll down and we can see now that our soil test has imported and that we've got the six um, fundamental nutrient indicators or soil test indicators that we need to include in our go crop account for nutrient management planning purposes. And that in a nutshell is how you import soil tests. I think we're ready for break or Heather, you have any other pieces you'd like to connect on? Nope. I mean, I think we are ready to break and set people free <laughs> to do their, do their homework. Um, I will stay on in case anybody has questions online or needs additional help. So. I will also um, create the breakout rooms as soon as I stop recording. <laughs>